All right. I'm going to move over here so you guys can actually see me instead of the giant hardware. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jim Anders. Uh, you can find me pretty much anywhere I want to be found on the web at janders223. Um, today we're going to talk about moving from the server side to the client side with AngularJS. And AngularJS loves Rails. So, a little bit of a backstory about this project. Um, you have to understand a little bit about my CEO. He's very, very eccentric. And he loves to just sit around and think up new things to build. And he's terrible about coming in first thing Monday morning, and he's like, I had this brilliant idea. How fast can we get it out there? Well, do you see this? You know, and I pull up my, my Trello board, and I'm like, here's all the things that I'm working on, and here's all the things my team is working on. Which one of these do you want to knock off the list to get your new thing done? And this project was born out of that. He had, uh, he had friends or family. This was right after we moved into our new building. He had friends and family come in for the weekend. And he brought them into the lobby. And there's these two giant pillars. And he's like, that would be a beautiful place for a touch screen that had this fancy interface. And you could find things in the building. And we get lots of outside guests that are looking for hotels, looking for restaurants, trying to check in for their flight. And he's like, you know, I see these in hotels all the time. We should do something like that. So he comes in on that Monday morning. How fast can we get that out? I'm like, uh, a month or two from now. And then that's when uh, he went all NFL bounty program on it. Get it done by Friday. And there's lunch and other perks. And I'm like, all right, cool. Lunch with the CEO. I can knock this out. So a 60 hour work week later, we knocked out the Rails application. And what he really, really, really wanted was this. <laughs> he wanted Jarvis in our lobby. He wanted to be able to touch and manipulate and move. And, you know, server side, that's not what he got. It was very, very, um, it was just slow. It was terrible. So that's not what he got. Oops. It was really, really slow. Um, it's actually being driven by, we have these two little, I don't know, they're about that big, PCs running some Linux distribution. They have like a 1.2 gigahertz Atom processor. They have, uh, I think, just a gig of RAM. So it was really slow. It was very, very, very jQuery heavy, you know, doing all the Ajax. And then the page refresh, going between all the different pages just killed the usability because you walk up and you're like oh I want to check in for my flight wait 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 okay there it is and it just people got frustrated so continuing the backstory I had been evaluating JavaScript frameworks from Backbone to Ember and then a friend of mine got me on Angular so we talked about, you know, page caching, all these things that we could do. And the fix was to Angular all the things. So leveraging uh, local storage, leveraging um, timeouts to fetch the data. So every 15 minutes it goes in queries for new data. If it's fresh, we cache it in local storage. If not, um, I'm sorry, if it's fresh, we ignore it, and um, if it's stale data, then we uh, update the local storage. So I sat down on a Saturday morning on my evaluation of finally getting to, to Angular, and I went through their tutorial on their site. Got through that in about three, maybe four hours, and I'm like, all right, this is awesome. I'm falling in love with Angular. It does all these cool things. Let's rewrite this application. And I came in the following Monday morning with the application completely rewritten in Angular. And we got it up, and it just works beautifully. Until there was a huge memory leak, which is always fun in a JavaScript application to track down. Um, so we got through that, and everybody was happy. Lessons learned. What did I have down here? Oh, yeah. 
So things that I learned in moving this uh, application over was to, uh, to fall in love with directives. Um, the Angular directives are powerful when you learn how to use them. At first, and in this application, I mean, this was my first true Angular application. I didn't leverage them the correct way. So now that I've moved on, um, I, I love directives. I pretty much sit down with the designer in the beginning of a new project, and we start framing out pages. And we're like, okay, we're reusing this more than once. We're going to move that into a directive. And then we sit down and we build that component out as a directive, and we go from there. Uh, the other big thing I learned with this is that Angular doesn't work for everything. Uh, it's great in this type of setting, using the touch interface, but for the back end of this, which still is a server-side application, I, A, I didn't take the time to do it, and B, I don't know that I want to. There's a lot of data manipulation on the back end of this. Setting that timeout, setting um, locations for weather data, um, it could be done, I just haven't taken the time to do it, and I still don't know if it's the right fit. Um, the other lessons that I learned, um, and I actually, there was a, come on in, join the crowd, get some pizza. The other big lesson I learned was to stop relying so heavily on jQuery with Angular. Uh, there was recently a very good blog post uh, by a guy named Joel Hooks. Um, he did a lot of work back in the days with Flash and ActionScript, wrote an MVC library for that, and uh, I can't remember the name of the post, but it was stop using jQuery as a crutch. And it was a really great post. Um, you know, and he talked about um, words escape me at the moment. This is terrible. I hate when it happens. Huh? I, hate when it happens. I know. <laughs> but anyhow, he was talking about directives, not using the jQuery as a crutch, um, you know, rely on the native JavaScript and or the JQ Lite that ships with Angular. And this is going to be really quick, and I'm really sorry. Things that I think to avoid um, and that I've actively tried to avoid in future Angular and Rails projects, asset pipeline. I will never again put an Angular application inside of the asset pipeline. I, and I will switch to code to show you why. Yeah, go deep on that. So this is the code for this application. Um, all the JavaScript lives inside of the asset pipeline. So then, let me know if you need another font bump. Um, Do you want to try turning off the lights up there? Yeah, we can. I can switch my theme real quick. That might help. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that's good. Uh, that's good. Uh, da, 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 da. Is that under view? I have no idea. Uh, wait, 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 wait. That's better. So this is my standard application JS. And the first like hurdle with this was that the bottom of that directive is usually require tree. <laughs> and everything was just loading whenever it, f whenever it, you know, asset pipeline decided to load it. So then it would be like, oh, I can't find Angular. Oh, I can't find, you know, some directive or some controller. I'm like, crap. So then the next thing was to build out other um, asset pipeline directives to start loading things in the order that I want. And if we look at, oh, no, it's not in there. <coughs> I think it's in here. Yeah. So then we're loading our... Uh, 
loading things in the particular order that we want. So ensuring that everything in the application JS is loaded first, then inside of the libs directory, I have my Angular stuff in there. So Angular resource and Angular. So then I make sure those are loaded before trying to load up my application directory. And again, this was a very, very first attempt. So I've got things all over the place in here. And a lot of things now that I see are just terrible ideas. So again, I would avoid the asset pipeline in all future projects. And I've moved to doing um, using Yeoman with Grunt to build Rails projects so that I keep them separate keep them tested separately. Um, and there's several great Grunt plugins to work with Rails and Angular together. One is um, Grunt Connect Proxy, which allows you to set up in your Grunt file. Um, it'll proxy all local host requests to the IP address and port of your choosing so that I can say, make any local request go to my Rails server. Um, What's the other one that I use? Oh, it comes with the basic Yeoman app, but it's the, um, the, all the compile tasks and setting the, uh, the distribution directory. Then set that so that it compiles your application to the public directory of your Rails app. And then when Rails picks up and sees that there's an index.html in the public directory, it serves that and then serves um, your Angular application. So again, this is really short and sweet. Um, we can dig through the code a little bit if you guys want. There's plenty of that to see. Um, actually, do you want to see the application first and then we can talk about code? That's probably better. I'm sorry? Uh, I could pull it up on GitHub. I'm sure it's there in a commit somewhere before going to Angular. Uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't have it running anywhere. I, I meant to pull down <laughs> that commit and get it running, but there just aren't enough hours in the day. So let's do this. And before you said it was a 1.2 gig atom processor that was yeah. on the client side. So uh, yes, yeah, it's it's screen. it's a little just acting like a browser. Pretty much, right. I mean, it's just jQuery and whatnot, right? Yep. And then it was hitting the back end, which was a Rails app sitting on Heroku. Okay, okay, so outside third party service. Yep. So it's still being hosted on Heroku. Okay. Um, let me switch screens here because it views much much better on the actual touch screen. Power off. It was working. Woo! So this is going to be the hard part. Just trying to control it from to get everything where it needs to go. Sometimes, oh good, it kept its calibration. So, um, again, when guests walk into the lobby, this is what they see. And actually, this is live data. We have Luxottica guests in our building using our training room today. Um, but as they come in, if they need to get to the airport, we've got a little Google Maps, and it's kind of hard to see the blue line, but it's showing the actual route. And then, of course, you can change routes with the different uh, results it gives. And then if they're going to DAY instead, gives them different options. And then of course with the Google uh, Maps traffic overlays, it shows you all the hot spots, which everything's green right now, but come 4.30, 5 o'clock, you know, 71's pretty much red the whole way down, or at least from 275 to Pfeiffer. 
same thing with weather. Hasn't pulled down data yet, but we've got um, the 10 hour, next coming 10 hours, the current forecast. And then one of the really cool things we did with directives, um, this background changes based on the current weather. So if it were raining, there's a picture with raindrops. If, it are, if it's snowing, it looks like there's snow back there. So that's all handled through a directive. Once it loads the weather, it sets the background. And then our contact list. So everybody in the building is in here. Apparently the scroll doesn't work too well on this screen. So this isn't the actual production screen that we have in the lobby, I should probably say that. Uh, this has a, a touch overlay. The ones in the lobby are actual touch screens. And the scroll works there, I promise. So then you can cycle through all the different companies in the building, find the person you're looking for, and then contact them. Uh, one of the things we're hoping to add uh, is with our, our uh, voice over IP phone server. We're wanting to put in a click to dial so that you could just dial that person directly from here and then get in touch with them. And we're playing around with doing some uh, video conferencing directly from here. So if you want to see who's actually in the lobby, you could start a video session. And then you want to find somewhere to go to lunch. Uh, let's go to Gold Star. So we map, give directions, and then with the Google Places API, you can get the open data, whether they're open or closed, which is really nice. Hotels. And again, I don't know why this touchscreen doesn't like the scroll, but I want to go shopping. Find a movie or I don't know why entertainment pulls up a bunch of bars, but <laughs> that's odd. And then the flights API, which wasn't working earlier, and I don't know why. They must have changed something. Oof. But normally, you know, you get a big list of flights, and you can switch between Dayton and, and Cincinnati. And then our building map. So if you need to find, I mean, unfortunately, all these doors are locked, so you can't really get out of the lobby. <laughs> but <laughs> if you need to know your way around, uh, you can go through and find. And I think we still have some space available if anybody's company's looking for to rent some space. They don't want to be up this far up north. And then there's a, a, a screensaver that's on a four-minute, I think it's four-minute timeout. So it'll come up if it's idle for four minutes and it just has a little animation and dims the overlay that says, uh, you know, touch anywhere to begin or something. I think that's also in a directive if I remember correctly. Yes, sir. Are you polling the back end or do you have some sort of soccer thing? We are polling, unfortunately. It's, uh, it seems to be the easiest way. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Well, you know, like I said, the original version of this was built in a week. Mm -hmm. And then it was upgraded to an Angular front end in a weekend. So it needs some tender love, but there's just not enough hours in the day, unfortunately. Yes, sir. The clock. The timeout function that runs the clock, which updates every second. It was just oh. dumping memory like crazy. So does that exist in every view? I didn't notice. The clock, yeah, it's it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm pretty sure, where's my mouse? Oh wait, it's a touch screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So this is, what's 
This is um, the directive that runs the clock. Oh, uh, sure. So we're just passing in timeout, date filter, injecting, sorry. Um, update time, sets the element text, runs the date filter, and then we run the timeout every second, which calls update later, which runs itself, and then we watch the attributes and update the value. Oh, I do have the cancel, yeah. Coffee yes, script there? yes, I'm a very big fan of Coffee Script. So was the cancel what uh, fixed the memory leak? Or what yes, was the, oh. the cancel was was what fixed the memory leak, like you said. So, but yeah, it was. Yeah, so it runs. If I go back to it, where is it? Where did it go? I know. Did I close it? Chrome DevTools. Chrome DevTools are awesome. Yeah. Oh. You tried Firefox and Chrome. What? Did you finally see Chrome? So in production on the on the actual touchscreens in the lobby, it's still running on Firefox because um, they're Ubuntu. It's like Ubuntu 12.04, I think, is what they're running. The Firefox kiosk mode in Ubuntu is better than Chrome's, which is some weird thing. And I actually recently ripped out um, some functionality, which I didn't completely get out. Where is it there? So this is really weird working on this. <laughs> so profile in the memory, it climbs up a little bit at first, and then it kind of levels out. But it's running about 27 megs right now. And then it falls off. Wow. So, and I, I'm pretty sure that's the cancel function that causes it to fall off. But yeah, it would hit 54, 60, 75, 100, 120, and then just crash. It would hit, you know, several hundred megs of memory. And then on those little atom processors, it, with one gig of RAM, it would just crash immediately. The only issue that we currently have is this time of year, at about 10 to 12 AM, the sun comes in the lobby and hits the touch screen and messes with the IR sensors in it. So you'll go to touch, and it'll be the mouse will shoot halfway across the screen. But yeah, Chrome DevTools, if you don't use them, they are awesome for your Angular application. I get on my designer all the time when we're pairing. He's working in Firefox. And something won't work on an Angular app. And I'm like, dude, just open it in Chrome. I have to see this in Chrome to be able to, to find this, this error. And it's, it's awesome because we'll open up. Uh, he has Firebug. And Firebug won't catch the JavaScript error. And then I open it up in Chrome, and Chrome catches it, which is. Oh, yes, Batarang. That's another good thing. So there's a, a Chrome extension that I believe is directly from the Angular guys. I'm not really sure. But it allows you to get deep inside of your application in the browser. Um, so time format, date format is in my scope there. That scope has no models. So then I can see what data I'm actually binding to the scope and then passing to my view. And then there's also, if you look at, come on, go away, elements with the Batarang installed, there is actually a, uh, It'll actually give you, so if I look at, for instance, oh, the screensaver's on. Something that has, so the ng view, 
when I go into the NG view, I can actually go in and inspect all of the stuff on the scope and listeners and everything that that Angular has to offer. So the watchers, I've got two objects in the watchers array. Yeah, all kinds of good stuff. Should probably stop that memory profile. Oh, it hit 44 megs at one point. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot. It's a very, very small application. Sure. I mean, these are on the projector. Yeah. Uh, on this one, they're actually because it was a Rails app to begin with. It had cucumber features. <laughs> So I'm still running those on this one, which is the bad part um, about this one. But everything now, because I'm using Yeoman, I'm running uh, Jasmine and the Karma Test Runner. Oops. So this is the time directive. Uh, it's pretty simple. The background. Oh, wait. This one is actually not what I thought it was. This one sets the background for each individual page. <coughs> so we're watching the location path. And then when it's a certain path, it gets a certain background image. Uh, and again, relying very heavily on jQuery there when I could have just used JQ Lite. It's also nice that you put all your down manipulation in the directory. That's like where you're going. Right. Dom, dom manipulation in the controller is a big no no in Angular. Um, and then the only other one that still is in use in here is the screensaver, uh, like I said, which just does a little bit of, uh, of um, CSS animation to swoosh the, the two lines of text come from the left and the right and meet in the middle, wait for a second, and then fade out. Can you go back to the previous one? The, the background? background? Sure. Scroll, I see you're on the, can you scroll down some? Yeah. I mean, it's it's just a yeah. huge case statement of when the path you is a certain into thing. Class there. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, probably could have, yeah. yeah. Again, just things I learned. Yeah. I just found out about ng class. We use ng class very, very heavily. I w all right. Let's do this. You guys did not see this project. <laughs> <laughs> so here, yeah, there's an ng class. Um, so for like active states, um, you know, we have this app has a, a big left side navigation. So for the active state on that, we're using ng class. The top bar navigation relies heavily on ng class. Um, ng class is really fun to write in Haml. If any of you guys are familiar with Haml. And I've, I've seen other ways of writing this portion of it, but I can't get any of them to work with Haml. Do you prefer using Haml for Angular apps? I prefer using Haml, period. Yeah. Um, I found that it gets a little, because you can't do multi-line. Well, and it's funny because all the templates in this one are pure HTML. But now that I've got, you know, everything set up, I, I much prefer Haml. I'm just faster with it. Because I always, always, always forget closing tags. Because I'm so used to CoffeeScript and, and Haml from the Rails side that closing tags, closing curly braces, things like that are, are hard for me to remember. 
and some of these got really, really long. So in your new shiny feature where you're using Yaml, what are you using for a markup? It's, it's Haml. No, it's just pure Haml. Yeah, it's um, so this is the one thing that I don't like about um, the Haml compiler in Grunt is you have to give it every single file name. You can't just say watch a directory and compile all the files in it. So you have to pass it. It, it is, and I just haven't had time to. This is Hamel Contrib. I cannot get it to watch a directory to save my soul. Because, you know, so normally, um, like you would do something like this, right? If I do that, then I end up with a star star directory, um, that as a directory, a subdirectory, then that as a subdirectory, and then nothing in it if I tell it to, to watch that. But we can definitely talk and, and see if there's something better because having to go in, remember, every time I need to create a new view, I have to go in and update the grunt file. Well, then I have to restart grunt server and it's, it's a pain. But my love for Hamel is great enough that <laughs> it's worth the pain. <laughs> but this guy has plenty of, oh, he only has five. Date picker, that's the fun one. Um, it's one of the worst things to try to do a date picker in Angular. And again, this one does rely heavily on jQuery, but there's tons of DOM manipulation in this one. Uh, notifications, and a lot of this is just doing dummy stuff because my designer can't connect to the server right now for whatever reason. I don't know why, so there's a lot of dummy data in here. I wish I could show you guys this because this one's pretty cool, but unless you all want to sign an NDA, we'll be here all day. Um, firing a modal, so the um, if any of you are familiar with, with Zurb's foundation, uh, they have a really nice um, reveal is their modal. So we've got, uh, got a um, directive here to fire the modal. Star rating robbed heavily from um, bootstrap or uh, Angular UI bootstraps star rating modal or um, directive. Got that working in foundation. And then, oops, our side nav. Get away from me. So then, somewhere in here. Yeah. So checking the, because this uses uh, Angular UI router, we're checking the state includes the current, the link state to add the active class to it. <laughs> Smile, you're on TV. <laughs> you too. <laughs> so then this guy also, uh, we did some window width stuff. So for our, uh, it's, you know, a nice big thick side nav. I think it's three columns in foundation. So then when you collapse to 1024, it goes to just a nice little arrow that you pop the menu out. So then we're watching all that. And then the other one in here is we have, um, we call them smart panels, but it basically pulls a list of five items from the server, and then you can expand one item, and then it collapses the rest. So then we're watching all that um, with a bunch of other stuff. And then this has been my current focus. So it's finally, we're getting away from the design and, and prototyping stage and getting to talking to some real data on the server, which is 
the API v1 resources is where it is connecting through the, the connect proxy back to the rail server I have running locally so that I can test them independently. We kind of took a very deep dive from touch screens there. So back on your touch screen project. Sir. Um, how did you structure like each of those different like pieces of functionality? Are they different controllers or different directives? Or different controllers. Okay. Um, and you're using just the routing? And just using standard routing. So each one, you know, the contacts just pulls, you know, standard uh, angular resource contact.query to get the list. And then the, the location thing is the piece that I ripped out because people have moved and it was hard to update. But basically in the, the contact list you could click on somebody's name and it would point you to their location in the building on the map. Unfortunately with so many people it just doesn't work very well anymore. But yeah, everything is pretty much a controller with lots and lots of data manipulation on the flight data because they send back so much stuff. There's like an object full of airports. There's an object full of airlines. And then there's an object full of flights. So then munging all that together into one object that I can actually use in the view, there's a lot of manipulation going on in there. Anything else? Uh, no, they're Angular resource. Um, so there's really just the three. But just using Angular resource, um, working on upgrading things to use Rails resource factory, which I think is a lot cleaner, provides promises, handles uh, relationships a lot better. Ish ish so that's one of my next big hurdles with the current app that i'm working on is moving from standard angular resource to rails resource factory I think angular rails resource is, is that what it is i, I yeah. won't pull it up but i've got it saved somewhere the problem is trying to use it outside of the rails project in the yeoman app It uses the asset right, so so <laughs> when you try to load it, your line in your index Hamel or your index file is like this long because it's vendor assets, JavaScripts, Rails resource or Angular Rails resource, then the file name, and then there's like two or three subdirectories. So I may pull that one down and yeah. A lot of, and that's another thing that I've noticed in doing, um, in doing it from Yeoman, a lot of the, uh, excuse me, a lot of these packages, they just didn't plan well for releasing them with Bower. Because if you look, you know, components, normalize, normalize CSS, but then if you get down you know, you have to go through like 12 folders to get to the file where they could have just compiled everything into one file and put it at the top level. And like I was saying, I think I have, oh no, I took it out. Oh no, there it is. What are we looking at? Those are like script tags to grab each other? Yeah. This is the, the Angular Rails resource. So because it was built as a gem to get to the files, oh, there it is. You have to go all the way down one, two, three, four, five, six, six folders to get to the files. So I think Angular did a really good job with their release. It's just right there.
Well, there's... Um, so as part of the build task, it runs copy. So then it'll copy the files that don't get compiled. So, you know, it compiles the coffee script, does all that. But then I've, instead of including all of that crap, I just, here's the two that aren't going to get compiled into anything else. Copy those over. I don't need all that other stuff. It's just cruft at that point. Any other questions? Did you bring up the, uh, the templates for one of your, uh, one of the HTML templates you had? Sure. From the, from the touch screen? Yeah, from the touch screen. Yes, these ones in here, they're pure HTML. So this is the, the building map page that just loads basically an SVG image um, for that floor. If we look at... And in your, uh, the line 12 to 15, oops. Is it, that's the dropping of the pin or what have you? Yes. When I finally get that, when I finally get that back to working, that will, uh, that's what does that. Which that's actually referencing a directive right there. So that's the, the power of the directives is you're teaching HTML new tags. You can also overwrite old tags. Sure. So from the building of oh, oh. location controllers where it's getting its position. Right. Tags. And then, you know, again, yeah. things I've learned, stop putting controllers directly in the, the markup and put them in the routes file or in your side of your route. So if you look I gotta bring that back out. So in here you know, I could say, controller right, I could say controller is building controller, and then I could take it out of my markup, which I've started doing because it's a lot cleaner. That's one of the things that I'm trying to focus on with new projects is to keep the markup as clean as possible because it's really easy with all the angular things to make your markup really, really dirty. Which is another reason why I've tried to rely heavily on directives, because it keeps a lot of that stuff out of the markup. Cool. Anyone else? Do you want me to bring it back up so you guys can play with it? All right. Well, thanks, man. Wonderful. Jim, somebody asked me.